I was talking to a man Friday about ministers and who they come up under, and, and I feel for certain I could go into any primitive Baptist church in this country that's in their right mind, and, and, and I could say, I'm under Brother Sam, and they'd say, well, come on in, because <laughs> we think a lot of you, Brother Sam, and I certainly appreciate that. So enough with that. Let's go to the book of Galatians. And I tried to preach through the book of Galatians a few months ago, and I've told you all this before. Um, I don't know if it's I didn't understand what I was reading or the spirit wasn't moving. I think that's what it was. Um, the book of Galatians uh, became so dry to me, and so I just I didn't even want to I didn't even want to look at it. And um, I think that was a, a great uh, learning experience that the Holy Spirit was teaching me that you just follow my lead and not your lead, and and things will go much much better uh, with you. You know I've prepared messages. For, for hours on end at times, and then sometimes messages have come to me on Sunday morning, and I, I get sometimes I get more compliments on those than I do the ones I spend all the time preparing for. Now, I try to prepare. I heard a preacher one time said, if you don't plan what you're going to say, you might say what you didn't plan. So I don't want to do that. But um, uh, uh, my grandfather, who's a, who's a minister, he, he gave me some great advice one time. He said, if you're going to use notes in your sermon, double space so you can allow some room for the Holy Spirit. So I try to... I try to allow some room for, for the Holy Spirit to, to work. Uh, but the book of Galatians, I've been reading in there this week. And, 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 you know, the book of Galatians has become one of my favorite books. And it's in, in just about every book of the Bible, in the New Testament at least, the epistles uh, kind of uh, give the same overall theme. That's the theme of the gospel, that Jesus is enough, right? The, the theme of the book of Galatians really is that, that Christ is enough for your justification, Right, we all want to know how do we get justified uh, before God, um, and and we could go into justification. Really, there's there's three aspects that that we've taught of justification. There's justification by the blood of Christ, uh, justification through faith, which takes place in what we've called the courtroom of of, of your your own mind and conscience. Right, um, we were the, God's elect people were justified by the blood of Christ on the cross of Calvary two thousand years ago. The same amount of people that were justified that day are the same amount of people that will be justified at the end of time. There won't be one added to it or one taken away from it. Uh, but people are justified in their own mind um, every day, I, I guess, through the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, um, that they come to a knowledge of justification. And there's nothing sweeter in this world than to know that you're just before a holy God, right? There's nothing sweeter to know. And then you can also be justified by your works. James talks about that, and, and it's all through Christ. You were justified on the cross, legally through Christ. In your, in your mind, you're only going to be justified uh, through Christ, and, and really, you're only going to be justified to others if they see you're living a life for Christ. Does that make sense? Those are the ways that you were justified. Listen to what uh, Peter, or Paul says. Um, there was a big problem that, that Paul's writing to these churches about, and that's that, that, that these Jews are wanting to go back to these dietary laws. They were wanting to to go back to circumcision. Just they, they wanted to mix the gospel of grace with the law service. And, and listen to what uh, um, Paul says in chapter 2 and verse 16. He says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Any justification, whether it's legal justification or um, a justification in your conscience is, is all based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> uh, not on anything that we've done. Um, if you flip back over to chapter 5, uh, the last time I was in the book of Galatians, I tried to teach on the works of the flesh, and I think we had enough of that for several years. Um, so if we will just uh, go to verse 22, and, the, and, and it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. How many of you, you know, here's one of the works, witchcraft. How many of you have ever said, I wish I could just have a little more witchcraft in my life? <laughs> Anybody ever said that? I never have. Or wrath. Boy, I wish I could just get mad a lot easier. Um, heresies. You know, the church would be doing a lot better if we had some more heresies. Has anybody ever said that? <laughs> but listen to what the Spirit of God gives you. The fruit of the Spirit is love. How many of you have said, I wish I could love more? 
uh, the, the joy. I wish I had more joy in my life. Peace. Long suffering. I tell you, we were getting ready this morning. I could have used some more long suffering. <laughs> Gentleness, goodness, faith. How many of us need more faith? Meekness, temperance. God's good, and He gave you those. You didn't have any of that. <laughs> You came into this world, you didn't have any of that. When you, you, you were born naturally of your, of your parents, you didn't have any of that. But if you're here today and you're a child of God, you've been born of His Spirit, you have all this. <laughs> if you need more of it, you know where to get it, the Spirit of God, right? <clears throat> he says in verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the, afflict, with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. And I want to look at verse 26 through chapter 6 and, and verse 10. And Paul's just going to give us some good advice. <laughs> good Christian advice. You know, I've been to marriage conferences, parenting conferences, and, and basically it all boils down to this. If you'll be a Christian, your life will be a lot better. <laughs> you, I could have wasted. Uh, I, I've wasted time at these, these things. I mean, they're good things to go to, but if you'll just be a Christian, your life will be a lot better. Uh, like Brother Sam said, nobody's ever... I've never heard anybody say, you know, I started following Jesus with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and things just got a lot worse. <laughs> they might have lost friends. <laughs> they might have lost um, opportunities in the workplace, but their life was a lot better, right? We all agree with that. He says, let us not be desirous of vain glory. <laughs> That's an easy thing to get to desire, isn't it? Vain glory, empty glory. You want to have the glory? we got religions built on people getting glory that they don't deserve. <laughs> Y'all realize that? We've got, we've got religions that are built on vain glory. It's empty glory. There's no glory there. And what, I, think he's, I think he shows what it does. Provoking one another and envying one another. <laughs> that sounds like the works of the flesh, doesn't it? Let us not be desirous of those things. So on the contrary, starting in verse 6, he starts telling us some things we ought to do. And I want to look at those things. He says, brethren... If a man, this is, this is chapter 6, the book of Galatians, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Uh, first of all, I'd like to look at who he's, who he's writing this to, the brethren. <laughs> he, he was, he, this, this was to brothers and sisters. He writes in the first chapter that he's writing to the churches of Galatia. There's multiple churches in this region of Galatia. And he says, brethren, brothers and sisters. One thing that teaches us just in this verse is that brethren, born again children of God, can be overtaken in faults. <laughs> right? And we see that, right? Solomon was overtaken in faults, was he not? Um, we, we see people all throughout the Bible that were overtaken in faults. That doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation for heaven, but you can lose it right here, right now, right? You can be overtaken in a fault. He says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, that, that means to be caught in a sin, uh, being off guard. Um, you know, armies try to overtake other people. Um, he says, if a man be, have, have you have ever been overtaken by a fault? I have. Have you ever gone to bed at night and you feeling good and you wake up the next morning and you, you're like, where did that thought come from? <laughs> It just happens like that, doesn't it? You can go to bed in the spirit and wake up in the flesh. You just be overtaken. You can be, you can be listening to good hymns and, and, and look at something you shouldn't look at just like that. It just overtakes you. I'll tell you all a story um, that I was telling Brother Taylor in the lunchroom. I decided yesterday to get me a good haircut. And you all are thinking, really? <laughs> <laughs> I've been for two years. I've been going to great... I've been going to Great Clips for two years, and you 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 can't ever get the same haircut. <laughs> um, but I told Carrie yesterday I'm gonna go somewhere and get me a good haircut. Somebody had recommended this place, and it was the worst haircut I think I've ever had. Let me tell y'all what happened to me. So I'm sitting in the chair, and she says, um, "Where do you part your hair?" <laughs> and I said, "Oh, I don't know. I just comb it over." And then I hear the clippers going. And about right here, the clipper hit my head. And y'all can look at it later. I thank God I'm tall because nobody can see this. I was overtaken. <laughs> I thought I was going to come out of there with a Nike check on the side of my head, you know. It overtook me. <laughs> um, and y'all laughing, but no, Brother Noah Meeks told me the, the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut is about three or four weeks. So... <laughs> 
Hopefully they'll grow back. You know what I did? I got home, and I walked in the door, and my sweet wife, I'd love to say she got up and said, it'll be better. <laughs> she laughed, and, and she said, what happened to the back of your head? <laughs> But I think it really accentuates my fat roll back here. So I think it looks good. I was overtaken. I, there was nothing I could do. I was just sitting there and I couldn't get out. And I kind of wanted to scream, but I didn't because there's other people there. I was overtaken. I was captured. <laughs> and, you know, we can do that in sin, right? <laughs> you can be free. Uh, the book of Galatians is all about freedom, living in the freedom that we have. Look at, look at uh, chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty of wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Uh, the, the message of the gospel is you're free, live in Christ. Christ offers you freedom, right? Freedom from, from sin, freedom from uh, you know, failed relationships, failed marriages, these things. If, if you walk in the, in the ways that Christ has prepared, you know there's that verse that says, stand ye in the way and look for the old paths. That's, that's where freedom is, and it's under attack in America today and in the world today. That they'll want to tell you a life of Christ is not worth it. But here Paul's saying, brethren, if there's a man who's overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. And I think that's very important, don't you? <laughs> ye which are spiritual. Um, you know, there's some people in the church that aren't very spiritual. <laughs> and so it could be sometimes people are spiritual and they lose their spirituality for a while. But Paul says, you which are spiritual, you which are living in these fruits of the Spirit, right? Um, verse 25 of verse 5 says, you live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Those that are walking in the Spirit I need to do something. Now, hopefully that's more than the pastor because there's just one of you, Brother Sam, and maybe a hundred of us. And, you know, the pastor can't do it all. <laughs> you know, I tried to preach last time about the, the, the children of Israel. They start... They start Blaming Moses, don't they? Mur murmuring. Why did Moses bring us out of here? And that's our nature. We start blaming the pastor. Well, why aren't there more people at church? Well, the pastor needs to do this. If we'd spend as much time just working as we do complaining, our churches would be a lot better. I guarantee you that. And he says, you which are spiritual. Um, you know, in Acts chapter 3, uh, when they're choosing, um, I guess the first deacons, you could say, uh, I believe it's Acts chapter 6. Uh, listen to this. It says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who may be appoint over the business. You know, deacons are spiritual, right? <laughs> so here's, here's something that deacons could do. Here's something that hopefully there are a lot of spiritual people in the church uh, that can do this. And he says, If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. I want to tell you, if you're, a, uh, I've said this before, the church uh, is not a country club for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. It's where we come to be restored, right? A lot of times uh, Christians are, are prone to, to make it just a country club for, 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 for those that are, you know, pharisaical. It's not, that's not what a church is. A church is a place of restoration. A church is a place where you should be able to go to get back on your feet, uh, to restore. That word restore means um, restore, as it were, a disjointed limb, like if, if your arm was out of place, to put it back together, right? Uh, to bring to a sense of, of sin um, or amendment of life. To, to if, if you read those two definitions, you're going to come away with this. Uh, what Paul is telling us to do in verse 1 of chapter 6 of the book of Galatians is a painful thing to do. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a painful thing that we're going to do. Um, when Evie Grace was a small child, uh, she, she had a table uh, fall over and hit her in the head. And they had to give her stitches. And she was not yet a year old. And, and they had to wrap her up in this, you know, cocoon-like thing to do the stitches. And... And I could barely watch it. It was just painful to see, right? So, so we can see that I can't imagine resetting a bone, doing something like that is going to be painful. Um, to, and it's to someone that you love. Because <laughs> if they're brethren, we ought to love each other, right? Brethren, we ought to love each other. It's going to be um, very painful. Telling someone, um, if, if, if someone is overtaken in a fault and it's obvious, um, telling them, is hard to do, isn't it? <laughs> it's hard to do. And, and um, you were talking about church discipline this morning, Brother Sam, and it is important that a church, uh, if you're going to do anything, like you said, you've got to have discipline. 
And, and in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus Christ gives us our blueprint for church discipline. We don't have to, to come up with it on our own. In verse 15, he says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he, he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Um, it's probably a lot easier just to take it straight to the church than it is to go one-on-one -on -one with that man. Does that make sense this morning? And sometimes maybe we may run too fast to something else. We just need to be one-on-one, -on -one, but it's hard to do. Um, but Paul tells us how to do it. He says, you that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit, catch this now, of meekness. <laughs> in the spirit of meekness. You know, meekness is, is just not having any arrogance about you, being humble. Um, it's a fruit of the spirit. <laughs> you say, well, I don't know how to go to him in meekness. We'll call on the spirit. We, we saw it in verse 23, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And a spirit of meekness. I mean, these are, these are tender things we're talking about. Uh, listen to what Albert Barnes, who's a commentator on the Bible, I jotted this down. He says, not with anger, um, not with an overbearing mind, uh, not with love of finding faults in others. <laughs> Y'all know people like that? <laughs> they love to find faults in others. Uh, not with a harsh and unforgiving temper, but with love, gentleness, humility, patience. I'm going to tell you, there's been a lot of harm done to churches by men who don't do this in love. <laughs> they just love to get on people, right? <laughs> there's been a lot of harm done to churches. And we should be, <clears throat> one of the fruits of the Spirit is long-suffering, so I think we ought to be long-suffering with people, don't you? <laughs> uh, God wouldn't have given us that ability to be long-suffering if we shouldn't be. And, and sometimes we're quick to, to jump on people, but just love them, <laughs> um, just, that's what God did to us, wasn't it? That's his example. <laughs> he just loves us. And he disciplines us from time to time. If you haven't been disciplined by the Lord, that's not a good sign. <laughs> right? That's not a good sign for you. Um, but he says, in, in a spirit of meekness, restore that one. And then he says, considering thyself or considering yourself. Um, that's some good advice. Just watch out for yourself first. <laughs> I consider yourself, I would say consider how you would want to be treated. <laughs> um, you know, I told Brother Wayne and Tracy, we, you know, we have lunch from time to time, and, <clears throat> and, and we said this, and I said, I'm telling you right now why I'm in a sober mindset that if I ever stop going to Vestavia, I want you to come to my house and pull me out of the room and get me in the car and bring me over there. <laughs> I said, I'm sober thinking right now, but there's a time I know myself. <laughs> I've considered myself. I've examined myself. I know that it's within me just to roll on over and go back to bed. <laughs> it's within me not to love what I love today. Have you ever noticed that? that? That there's been people that are on fire for Jesus Christ and then they die out. It's within us. He says, consider thyself lest thou also be tempted. You know, you're, we're talking about hard things here and you and, and we're just as able to be tempted. How many stories? Have y'all heard stories? I've heard stories of men who go to straighten out other men and come back with the same heresy or whatever they went to straighten them out with. <laughs> Consider yourself. Make sure you're the one that needs to go. <laughs> uh, make sure you're strong enough to do it. And then he says, bear ye, this is verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is just simple Christian living. And you know, Christians should be burden bearers. <laughs> should we not? Burden bearers. Um, uh, to bear something is just to carry something. Um, we all know what that is. And then a burden is just heaviness, weight. Um, it's just something that brings you down. <laughs> uh, it could be sin. Um, you know, in, I believe it's in Hebrews chapter 12 where he talks about um, throwing off the weight that so easily besets us. It could be sin. Uh, but there's a lot of things that aren't sinful that just weigh us down. <laughs> um, a lot of people are weighed down by the election. You know, that, that is a burden we don't have to bear, I guess, after Tuesday, we'll know. Um, but some people can't even sleep at night wondering who's going to be the next president. That's a burden, isn't it? Um, financial burdens. Um, there are all kind of burdens uh, that we need to bear. One of them, just people that are overtaken in a fault. Look at verse 1. That's a, a burden that we can bear. If you're overtaken, 
you know, somebody that's overtaken really doesn't even know that they're overtaken sometimes. Uh, that's something that you can go to them and bear uh, that burden. Just simple examples. You could visit somebody. <laughs> Some people are just lonely. Did y'all know that? Some people are just lonely. And you could go visit them. Uh, listen to what James says. He says, pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. <laughs> that's, that's true religion right there, right? An undefiled religion. Uh, that's not a vain glory religion. That's not something that provokes others or envies one another. That's just pure religion, just visiting one another. That's a burden uh, that we can bear for others. How about just encouraging people? <laughs> is, that, is that a discouragement ever, a burden that you suffer with? <laughs> that's a burden that I have all the time, just discouragement. Um, the kids went to bed. What night was it, Carrie? I guess Thursday night. And you know, sometimes it's... Very rarely. It's very peaceful. <laughs> and it's just, thank you, Father, for a good day. And they'll go to bed. And some days it's World War III. <laughs> and parents can get discouraged. And you know what we need? Burden bearers <laughs> that'll come in and say, it's going to be all right. <laughs> People that'll come in and, and maybe can give you some advice or help you out, I would say, if you're asked <laughs> for the advice. Um, you know, <laughs> most people are just going to give it to you anyways. <laughs> um, but that's good. <laughs> that's good. I've, I've listened to advice that, that was unwarranted before, and it's helped me. Um, but I sat down and said, Carrie, do you ever think you're just messing it all up from time to time? <laughs> like you're just not knocking it out anywhere? Listen to what the Bible says. It says uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you do, even as also you do. You know, the job of, of Christians is to build one another up. Because the world's tearing us down, right? The world's tearing us down. Um, the world is telling us that we're not cool. The world's telling us that we're foolish. The world tells us all kinds of things. It just brings us down, but we're here together to build one another up, right? <laughs> uh, you, you preached last week, Brother Sam, about Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church. But in the book of Galatians, Paul says that he went to, um, I won't even turn it, he went to, to Peter and James and John's, uh, and, and he talks about them being pillars in the church. <laughs> that's what, the, that's what the, the, the church needs is more pillars <laughs> to hold up the church and hold up those in the church. I heard Ronald Lawrence one time, he said, that's P-I-L-L-A-R-S, not P-I-L-L-O-W-S. <laughs> we got enough sleepers. Brother O.C. was walking out this afternoon, and I said, Brother O.C., are you leaving? And he said, no, I'm staying. I can sleep as good here as I can at home. <laughs> Now that was encouraging, brothers. <laughs> we need to build each other up. That, he's been the, one of the most encouraging people uh, to me. This has been an encouraging church to me. I don't think we have this problem, but we can slip into it. <laughs> like anybody else, we could be overtaken with it. He says, so bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, these Galatians, just like many people today, were just, they were... They were trying to fulfill the law. They were trying to be circumcised. They were trying to, to keep the dietary laws. They were just all about keeping laws, laws, laws. He said, if you'll just bear one another's burdens, then you can fulfill the law that really matters, the law of Christ. <laughs> I believe that's the law of love. Listen, listen to, to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14. It says, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you want to fulfill the law of Christ, uh, just be a burden bearer. Just, just love each other, right? <laughs> We need to love each other. Um, the world needs more people that just love each other. Um, listen to Matthew chapter 22. Je Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. One of, on these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. You know, if you just want to fulfill the law of Christ, just love people, right? <laughs> That's hard to do, though, isn't it? Um, <laughs> notice in, in, in verse 14 in Galatians, it says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's not hard to love yourself, is it? <laughs> I don't find it hard to love me. <laughs> you know, I might, there's a lot of times that, you know, I might leave my shoes out in the hallway, and that's fine. <laughs> but, boy, if I trip over something that Carrie left out at 2 o'clock in the morning, boy, that's not all right, is it? Because I love myself. 
but I find it harder to love others. If we could just love others as ourselves, just be forgiving. <laughs> that's just good marriage. That's, that's a marriage counseling right there. Just love your spouse as you love yourself. Uh, you know, if, if, if I wanted a milkshake at 10 o'clock at night, I'd go get it. <laughs> if Carrie, she wouldn't do this. I wish she would more often. I'd like to go get milkshakes at 10 o'clock at night. But if she got up and said, go get a milk, I'd, I'd, I'd say, well, I don't want to get out. <laughs> Does that make sense? That's a simple example. But just love each other. It says, for if a man... If a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. <laughs> um, you know, basically what that's saying is just don't have too much confidence in yourself. Remember where you came from. <laughs> you, ever, you ever known people that, that, that forgot where they came from? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're merely dirt. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, we're, we're of the dust of the earth. Don't forget where you came from. Um, You know, if, if you become too self-confident, you're not gonna you're not gonna want to bear the burdens of others. You not want to you not want to go uh, try to restore someone. You know what? You, if you're in the spirit and you see somebody that's overtaken in a fault, uh, if you're in the spirit, if you're a spiritual person, your response will be, "I, I need to go help them." Uh, that could be me. But if you start thinking yourself better than you are, your response will be, "Well, they brought it on themselves." <laughs> That'll be your response. Have you ever thought that before? I have. Well, they probably bought it on themselves. Um, if, if you don't think of yourself too much, you can fulfill verses 1 and 2. Then in verse 4 he says, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. I think he's saying contrary to these, uh, to thinking too much of yourself, uh, go out and, and prove your own works. Are you, are you fulfilling works of the law? <laughs> Uh, are you fulfilling the works of the flesh? Are you fulfilling uh, the good works that we were created to do? Um, you know, self-examination is the best examination, wouldn't you say? <laughs> um, you know, we can be nitpicky on other people and, and just completely overlook things that, that we should be doing. Um, like me, griping about people not liking the Facebook page, and I hadn't even done it. <laughs> Y'all remember that? That's, that's confession. It's good for the soul. But let every man prove his own work. Let every man test his own work. Uh, Brother uh, brother, um, Vernon Johnson, in his commentary on the book of Galatians, uh, makes a great point that's very simple. You know, if you've never read Elder Vernon Johnson, go do it. You're missing a gem (laughs) of a commentator. It's so simple to understand. Uh, It's so clear. And he says, you know, everybody's got a work to do. (laughs) So just uh, test your own works. And and I would say if if... if there's nothing to test, you're doing it wrong, <laughs> right? If there's, um, listen to Ephesians chapter 2. Starting in verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, that doesn't say that God is foreordained. We will walk in them, but we should walk in them. Why were you created in Christ Jesus? You were created. You were his workmanship. He made you to fulfill the good works that he's laid out for you to do. That's your job, right? That's what we've done. I've, I've said this before. Many of us are crazy. You're talking about legalizing marijuana in, in, in four or five different states. It's because people aren't doing what they were created to do, and they're going crazy, right? Do we agree with that? People aren't doing what they were created to do. They're suppressing the Holy Spirit. So we have good works that we can do. And then he says, then shall they have rejoicing in himself alone and not another. Um, you know, if, you, if you're testing your work, proving your work, and, and you ever see a work of the Holy Spirit in you, if you ever see a little faith, a little peace, a little gentleness, <laughs> a little meekness, a little temperance, um, it's nothing to boast about, but it's something to rejoice about. <laughs> do we agree? <laughs> Because it wasn't there at one point in your life. If you ever see that there's a work in your life, if you, if you find yourself loving somebody like you love yourself, then you can rejoice. And not in yourself, but you can rejoice in the miraculous work of grace that took place in your heart sometime before that work took place. Do we understand that this morning? We can rejoice. He says, for every man shall bear his own burden. That's not a contradiction to verse 2. Um, 
I think he's just saying we're all responsible for our own actions. <laughs> Does that make sense? We're all responsible. You know, a lot of people want to uh, throw off on other people. It's his fault, her fault. Um, the buck stops with us, right? And in verse 6, he says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Um, the word communicate means to share or to be a partner. Um, it's used in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 14. It says, Notwithstanding, um, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 18, when Paul's uh, giving uh, Timothy an admonition to those that are rich in this world, he says that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to, uh, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, that is to share or to become a partner with someone. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 16, the other place it's used, it says, but do good and communicate, and to communicate or to share, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Here Paul is teaching us something uh, that I think we all need to know. Uh, Let him that is taught in the word, that's me and you, communicate unto him that teaches. So we're to share in all good things with those that teach us. Does that make sense? Um, and, And you know what? It's not, it's not that we're to have a salaried minister or something of that nature, uh, but we're all in this together, right? <laughs> it's a partnership. Brother Sam isn't just our pastor that we pay to come up here and preach to us. He's our partner in advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? He's our partner. And I tell you, if, if you <laughs> if, if you got some skin in the game, you might want to be in the game more, right? <laughs> So communicate with those who teach you in all good things. And then he says in verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Um, whatever, it's, that's simple, isn't it? Whatever you give your time to, whatever you give your money to, that's what you're going to reap. <laughs> I think there's a direct correlation here to verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that he shall also reap. If if we're not willing to communicate with those who teach us, we're going to get what we ask for, right? (laughs) If if a man um, has to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week and then come in on Sunday and try to preach to us, uh, I'm talking about secular work. We get what we ask for. Uh, it can be done. People have done it. People do it. Um, but you know, it hadn't always been done like it is today. I think we do a much better job as Primitive Baptists in 2016 than we've ever done with this, at least from what I've been told. Uh, I've heard Brother Sonny Piles talk about it, and he's about an expert on any subject Primitive Baptist, I guess. If you say Sonny Piles said it, they say, okay, and move on, right? You talking about study, and I heard Brother Sonny say in a sermon not recently I was listening to, he said Primitive Baptists used to get up, and he said it was a requirement of the preacher for the first 15 minutes they'd have to tell you how dumb and uneducated they were, and then for the next 30 minutes they'd have to prove it. <laughs> Thank God we got good preachers now, right, <laughs> who take time to study. And you know, it's men like Sonny Piles, who's a pillar in this church that changed the way we think. It's, it's men like that. That's what I was talking about earlier, pillars that lift us up and build us up. And people saw what he could do. People saw what his studying would do. And people began to study. That's not, I mean, that's what people have told me. <laughs> and there's been a difference in the Primitive Baptist Church just because of, I mean, that's one man making a big difference, right? I told Brother Obey's brother here today, Rejoice. I said, you know, I never really knew Brother Obey. I met him one time. But I have so much respect for him. That man was a difference maker. <laughs> you know, we're not just here to just run through life and just die, right? <laughs> Uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're here to make a difference. If we're not making a difference, then who's going to make a difference, right? And that's the thing. I Think about what Brother Obey has done. One man from Tanzania, Africa, has made a difference in this world. Don't think you can't make a difference in this world, right? Sometimes I just get thinking, I'm just an average person. What difference am I going to make? God, God used the donkey to speak. <laughs> he can use me. I, I think about that a lot of times. I'm sitting on that bench about to step up here. I say, you know, God, can, he's used animals before. <laughs> he can bring a word out of my mouth. 
It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If we don't support our ministers, we're going to get weak churches. But also it's just a general life principle, is it not? <laughs> um, <laughs> for whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Whatever you put your time, money into, that's what you're going to get back. You wouldn't plant corn and, and, and reap pumpkins, would you? <laughs> That'd be weird, wouldn't it, Every Grace, if you planted corn and you reaped a pumpkin? <laughs> If you, if, if you spend all your time watching the TV and all your time worrying about the things of this life and, and you don't spend any time at worrying about the church, you don't spend any time worrying about the Bible, you don't spend any time in prayer, well, it's not, it's not the church's fault. It's not God's fault <laughs> that you're not living a spiritual life that you want. It's your fault. <laughs> God's given you all the tools necessary, the meekness, the, the love, the joy, the, the fruit of the Spirit. He's given you your word, everything you need to live the Christian life, to live the good life, is given to you, it's up to you to go do it. God's not going to do it for you. Does that make sense? God's not going to do it for you. It says, For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth of the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth of the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. For he that sows to the flesh, if you're sowing to the flesh, Look, I love football and basketball and baseball as much as anybody. If we're obsessed with it, which a lot of people I know are totally obsessed with it, they wake up on Monday morning and they start reading about it and they wait all day till Saturday to watch the game and then Sunday they wake up in the morning to see where their team's ranked. You know, and it's all, it's, it's just a revolving door. That's all they're obsessed with. Well, you're not going to get that spiritual life that you want. <laughs> you're not going to get it. But it's okay. I, I mean, you know, I'm an Alabama fan. I know where my team's ranked. <laughs> <laughs> just let that sink in number one baby um, <laughs> for he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption and who wants corruption <laughs> but he that sows to the spirit now that person that's, that's out there that spiritual person that's bearing the burdens of others that's in his bible that's, that's praying that's in the church he that sows to the spirit that spiritual thing it's, it's shall of the Spirit reap what? Life everlasting. That's quite a difference, isn't it? Corruption and life. In case you, I don't want you to, to <laughs> I don't think any of you will, but that's not saying if you'll reap in the Spirit that you'll, you'll get to heaven will be your home because of what you've done. But you will live that good life right here and right now. All right, let's go to, let's go to the book of Tim, 1 Timothy. Chapter 6 and verse 11, it says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. What's, what's that called? That's called sowing to the Spirit, isn't it? <laughs> follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. That's where the good life is, folks, when you lay hold on that eternal life. When it becomes real to you. When it's as, when it's as real as this stand here. <laughs> That's the good life. And he says, if you will sow to the Spirit, you shall reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing. <laughs> Y'all ever get tired of just doing good? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I guess y'all don't. Good for y'all. I go to church with some good folks. <laughs> I get tired of it from time to time and think, this isn't worth it. I'm going to quit. I've told Kerry that before. I'm just going to quit. Nobody's going to change anyways. What good am I preaching? <laughs> Listen to what the Bible says. This is the Holy Spirit of God through an apostle wrote this to us 2,000 years ago and has preserved it in the King James Bible for us. It says, don't be weary and well-doing, for in due season, I think he's saying at the appointed time, we're going to reap. <laughs> and we're going to get that harvest. <laughs> when, when, when you say, yes, ma'am, say yes, ma'am, say yes, ma'am, say, I do that at my house a lot. Every grace is, I mean, she can almost do multiplication tables, but she can't say yes, ma'am, and no, sir. I'm like, it drives me insane. But one day I'm going to reap. 
at an appointed time, she's going she's gonna to say, yes, sir, <laughs> and go do it. <laughs> One day I'm going to reap. I'm going to keep getting up, and I'm going to keep going to Vestavia Primitive Baptist Church every Sunday morning and every Sunday afternoon. And I'm going to keep telling people about it. And I'm going to keep thinking of ways that I can invite my friends. I'm going to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And one day we're going to reap the benefits. I think we're reaping them right now, don't you? <laughs> we're reaping them. <laughs> don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And if you faint, who's, 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 whose problem is that? <laughs> is it God's? <laughs> it's yours. You know, I think that would indicate that we can faint, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, some people tell you, well, you're going to persevere to the end. If you don't, you're not a child of God. Well, this is going to tell you that there are some brethren who were overtaken in faults and fainted. <laughs> That's just, take it for what it's worth. But As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And I don't think there's anyone that can honestly say today, well, I have no opportunity to do good to people. <laughs> well, and brother, you're not looking for it because it's all around us, right? Amen. It's all around us. You could visit people. We talked about that. You could encourage people. You could invite people to church. You could, you could ask people how you can help and be sincere about it. <laughs> um, be sincere. But listen to Second Timothy. I'll finish with this. I think this is a perfect example of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. It says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me, and he was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. <laughs> That's the picture of a Christian person, is it not? When you have opportunity, do it. And you say, where's my opportunity coming from? Seek it out very diligently. <laughs> I hope this has been a blessing to you. I love this church. And if I can do anything for you, let me know.